Just make Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, the last talk of the con. Uh, thank you for, for attending. I'm, I'm, uh, very, uh, I know we're both humbled that everyone, uh, made it to the very last talk and it was ours. So, uh, we will be talking, uh, about IOCs today, intelligence led security tomorrow. Thank you so much for attending. So, um, just to get started, uh, I am a long, long time attendee, first time presenter. One of my favorite things about DerbyCon is the tradition that my friends and I uh, have created uh, when we when we um, come out here. So my my favorite tradition is every year we get here a day early, we rent a bus, we pile into it, and we take tours of different uh, bourbon distilleries. And uh, this year, here's some of the pictures. You see the bus there; it's fantastic. You see a picture of us, big giant pot still. It's great. It's fantastic. So. Uh, I was I was really excited to hear that I wasn't talking the day after our distillery tour. You know, it's a long day. You know, drinking a little bit. Uh, I didn't want to wake up and uh, do the the talk thing. So, found out it was on Sunday. Great, uh, that was perfect. But my my friend said, "Well, Matt, we we you know we have another tradition at DerbyCon, and that is we uh, every Sunday for brunch we go to the old uh, to the Brown Hotel and we eat." An old brown. That thing right there. So, uh, so, uh, it is as delicious as it looks, but I'm gonna warn you right now, I ate one this morning, and if my eyes start looking a little glossy and my breathing becomes labored, that's the reason why. Alright. So obviously my name is Katie Kupjanovic. If you want to spell it the old school way, back in the old country, that's how we spell it there. Um, I am a solutions engineer consultant for a very, very, very small but amazing threat intelligence platform company called Threat, um, called Eclectic IQ. And I've been in cyber for many years, but as a woman, I'm never going to give you telemetry to actually guess my age. I guess that's vanity. <laughs> And of course, uh, my name is Matt Shelton. I uh, work at FireEye. Uh, I, I actually am not in a customer-facing role. I work internally, so uh, we we protect the organization from the same threats that we're we're out there talking about. Uh, I'd like to say that part of our business model is docs and bad guys, and they, they don't really like it when we do that. So, been in the the industry for about 20 years. 
All right, so moving on. Agenda. So today, just briefly, we're going to talk uh, about a few things. Uh, we're going to talk about the problem. We're going to talk what is uh, intelligence-led security. We're then going to go over um, building an intelligence-led program, and then I'm going to hand it over to Katie to talk about how we automate and intelligenceify. and she did, she did just make up that word, uh, the intelligence life cycle. All right, so... Part of the problem with the current uh, the current uh, threat landscape is that threats are are getting more sophisticated. Uh, just recently, um, uh, there was uh, some some research published by ESET, uh, that Fancy Bear uh, group that we track as APT28 uh, has actually uh, uh, deployed malware that uses that takes advantage of the unified extensible firmware interface or E. Uh, UEFI to um, embed uh, malware into the SPI flash model of a target computer. What this really does is whenever the computer reboots, it first checks to see if the malware is still present, and uh, if it isn't, it reinstalls it. It's pretty, pretty sophisticated. Equifax. Equifax impacted 148 million consumers, and it seems like the list is growing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it used, uh, they, they used an in-day vulnerability to, uh, actually compromise it, uh, Apache Struts. Um, my, my company, uh, uh, has done a lot of research on Fin7. So, uh, on the hunt for Fin7 is a report that we wrote on our blog. Uh, August 2018, the DOJ actually unsealed, uh, indictments for three of the leaders of Fin7. Fin7 is a financially uh, driven team, and it operates at the maturity of a nation state. So we're no longer talking on just about APT threats targeting our organizations. We're talking about financially motivated threat actors who are just as sophisticated as some nation states. Another example, Iranian influence operations. Um, Iran actually conducted an influence operation recently that Facebook uh, took down that targeted audiences in the U U.S., U.K., Latin America, and the Middle East. Uh, I know my company has seen Iran become increasingly more sophisticated over the last two years, and we've even named three different APT groups uh, in just in the last two years coming from Iran. And finally, you know, my favorite, uh, not Petya, uh, you know, it's um, a sophisticated weapon that was masquerading as ransomware. Uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting things I find about, uh, about NotPetya was that they distributed it through the MEDOC Ukrainian accounting software. So we've been talking about supply chain threat for, for years. We keep seeing it compromise organizations, and this is a great example of the supply chain uh, being targeted to deliver malware. And, uh, of course, uh, Wired Magazine actually uh, says that the White House confirmed that there uh, were $10 billion worth of total damages across the world, $10 billion from a cyber attack. That's, that's a quite a, a large amount. So the threat's getting more sophisticated. Every day we're seeing more destructive attacks. We're seeing what used to be commodity threat actors just get more and more sophisticated. But really what it comes down to is I received this email from my vets that said due to a cyber attack they would not be able to deliver my cat's prescription uh, cat food in a timely manner. So uh, the threat actually got real. So, not Petra might have caused ten billion worth, of, ten billion dollars worth of damages, but it forced my cat to eat tuna for several weeks, and I'm sure my cat actually didn't care, but whatever. So, <laughs> so um, uh, IOCs. Uh, you know, part of the 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 genesis of this talk was that. Uh, Katie and I got together. We say everyone needs to look at how IOCs can be implemented in your security programs. But really what it comes down to, IOCs are not intelligence. And um, 
we wanted to go over some ways, some reasons why. You know, first off, uh, IOCs are temporal. Uh, just to give an example, virtual private servers, VPSs, uh, bad guys are using them all the time right now. Uh, in January 2018, uh, my company actually wrote about a campaign from APT34, a, an Iranian threat group. Uh, they deployed a PowerShell-based backdoor called Quad Agents. The PowerShell backdoor is distributed through weaponized documents and also uh, portable executables, but um, but it communicated uh, almost exclusively to different VPS hosts out, out of the Netherlands. You, you really can't turn that into an IOC, and if you do, it's going to be quickly outdated. Um, IOCs are also variable, so we are seeing uh, threat actors uh, increasingly use legitimate services to conduct attacks. So, uh, you know, uh, back in 2016, FireEye actually reported uh, the UPS team, I think we also call them APT3, using GitHub to, to, to distribute, uh, you know, executables. If you, if you take a look at this space, GitHub, Pastebin, all sorts of other legitimate services are increasingly being used. My favorite is domain fronting. Uh, very, you know, within the last year or two, uh, it was discovered that APT29, uh, which is a Russian-based group, was using Tor and the Tor domain fronting uh, plugin to uh, uh, hide encrypted traffic between Google and their, their victims using TLS. So you can't block Google. Uh, it's just not, not how it's going to work. And, of course, threats are infinite. IOCs are finite. We've talked about that quite a bit. I, I once uh, was was uh, listening to a colonel in the United States military who said, uh, he gave a quote, I, I wish I knew his name, I, uh, I would give him credit, but he said, if you rely on IOCs, you're always going to be shooting behind the enemy. And I think that that resonated with me. And so the brilliant JC he Jason Healy once said, a dollar spent on attack buys far more than a dollar spent on defense, we are fighting a uh, uh, an asymmetric war against the uh, the adversary, and the money that we invest in our own security programs has to be tailored uh, to what the adversary is is actually um, uh, targeting. So, what is an intelligence-led security program? This this is really how I look at it: is you take organization context. Uh, this is people within your organization. So, you know, uh, companies like FireEye and, um, you know, uh, other threat researchers conducting similar activities, they do great work on intelligence, but they don't understand your organizations like you do. So, uh, organization context is understanding what the, the high value targets are in your organization, understanding what your business does, and uh, then taking that and combining it with knowledge of the adversary. So uh, uh, what, what is the adversary doing to attack your, your organizations and, and combining that into something called uh, intelligence-led security? And that's really the intersection between your, the context of your organization and knowledge of the adversary. And what that, that gets us is intelligence-led security is predictive and it will help guide your security investments. So, uh, you know, left to boom. Everyone always talks about left to boom. Uh, this is how I like to think of intelligence-led security. Intelligence doesn't just help identify incidents before the actual boom happens, but I believe intelligence can be uh, fueled across the entire left to right of boom, you know, uh, Risk management is really where intelligence starts. Risk management is typically compliance driven. If anyone's ever dealt with SOC 2s and ISOs and all the other fun compliance regimes, that's typically where risk management programs uh, source uh, their, their, their risk. What I would like to see the industry do is to shift that around and start having intelligence-led risk management programs where intelligence drives 
the decisions within our security programs rather than the compliance regimes. And that starts with threat modeling. So, um, you know, threat modeling, you are identifying the applications within your, your environment. You are looking for weaknesses that can be exploited. And you are remediating based on the actual threat. So, uh, a gentleman by the name of Adam Shostak actually wrote the Threat Modeling Bible, and I highly encourage everyone to go check that out. Proper security control. So we think of IOCs detecting incidents from happening, but no one really uh, discusses how we can use intelligence to actually prioritize what security controls we put into our, our networks. Um, uh, so if the adversary is focusing on a particular uh, tactic to compromise organizations, well, then you should prioritize your security controls to, to go after that rather than, than you know, find the, the latest buzzword within the industry. And, and also, uh, one of the great things about left of boom is, is red teaming. So traditionally, we, we love vulnerability management programs, but I think sometimes vulnerability management can be reactive. So with red teaming, you are uh, taking how the adversary is going to be exploiting your environment and uh, equipping them appropriately to go out there and look for, for different threats. And of course, after an incident happens within your organizations, there's plenty of opportunities to use intelligence as well. Threat hunting, of course. Threat hunting is taking the, the, uh, the latest uh, TTP that, that a, a threat actor is looking for and identifying ways to actually detect that particular item. And then, of course, incident response. Uh, Katie's going to talk a little bit about pivoting in, in, in a future slide. And incident response is heavily fueled by, uh, by intelligence. And, of course, uh, in order to complete the, in, the entire uh, life cycle, a good postmortem on any incident can help drive and filter back into your security requirements within your organization. So there's a lot of intelligence frameworks that people people look at. Um, everyone knows the traditional intelligence cycle that's used across the intelligence community. Uh, I, I was actually in a presentation uh, just a, a week or two ago where a gentleman from the from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, talked a little bit about the uh, CMU intelligence framework. Uh, I believe uh, one of the uh, one of his 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 key key thoughts within his presentation was that the old intelligence uh, life cycles are are outdated and they don't properly work for cyber. And that is is very well uh, true. So they came up with this one. Um, I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, we like, so Katie and I uh, dubbed it the intelligence framework fidget spinner because it definitely looks like a fidget spinner. Um, but really when it comes down to it, uh, don't, don't overthink it. Uh, right size your framework for your environment. And most importantly, always start with requirements. Uh, after I just said don't overthink it, I'm going to throw up my uh, little life cycle that I like to think about. But, uh, you start with, with your requirements, what you're actually trying to accomplish. You then tailor your collection plans based on that. So your collection plan can be the different data sources you collect from, whether it's from external providers or your own internal data sources like your, your, your ticketing system for, for instant response. And then you got to do analysis on that data that you collect. That's, I think, where, where most people or most uh, intelligence programs have difficulty is taking the data that you collect and applying that organizational context to it. And of course, uh, how do you act on it? Uh, whether you, you do some sort of active block or you prioritize something that's, there's, the action piece is, is, is key. And of course, that should all go back and fuel the different, uh, requirements for your organization. So, uh, at, at, at FireEye, one of the dashboards that we prepare for our executive team is, is this one right here. And of course, uh, all the data on this is, is notional. But this, this dashboard guides our, our threat intelligence program. And it's a tool that we use that drives the security within our uh, environment. But it also is, is a, an effective tool that we can articulate the risk to our executive team, to our CEO, and to our board of directors. 
And what we've done here is we've taken the actors and or the groups that we know have targeted our organization. So this, this comes from our own internal um, holdings within our organization, our instant response uh, uh, tickets that we create, the cases. Uh, it comes from things that we found out on the internet. And uh, we use this to, 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 to articulate what the actual uh, threat is that we have seen targeting uh, firearm. Next, we have a second uh, group on here called actors and or groups watch list. And this, these are the groups that we think could potentially target our organization, and that is due to them being in the same uh, uh, industry vertical or them showing some sort of interest in what we've done. Uh, it's it, it it's it's powered by our intelligence uh, requirements, and we get this data from our sharing partners in the ISAC. ISACs we belong to uh, IT ISAC. We get it from our sharing partners in governments worldwide. We get it from our uh, commercial data feeds, uh, and it's a way for us to construct a list of groups that we think will be targeting us. Now you take all this. And we then compile all the TTPs that we think those groups will be using, and we list that as the priorities for what our security program will be uh, 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 monitoring for and also prioritizing our future security controls. And of course, we always have a key threat on the right that just gives a brief description of, uh, of who we think the the, ex the the one thing that our executive team should know about, um, we are, are we place right there in that key threat. So, um, one thing I, I just like to point out with the uh, TTPs uh, and and malware, MITRE ATT&CK can help. That's the framework that that we use uh, within our our environments. If you actually go to the MITRE ATT&CK webpage, they have a profile for APT28 on it, where they list out all the different aliases, and more importantly, they list out the techniques used by that organization uh, that have been observed in the wild. So when we have our threat dashboard, we take all those, those, those actors and groups that we think will be targeting our organization, and we construct something similar to this. And what that actually gets us is a prioritized list of of TTPs, attack methods, that we need to make sure we have protections for. So I, I think for most of the organizations uh, out there, uh, spear phishing is going to always be at the top of your list. So that's just kind of a uh, that's just everyone uses that. But then you start getting into other things, like, for example, uh, credential access, brute force. Uh, the Iranians are famous for password spraying, and that's if, if that's if you're a target of the Iranians, you got to look for things like password spraying. But what this allows us to do is prioritize what we need to build for our security programs and move on from there. And so, with that, I'd like to uh, hand it over to my co-presenter, uh, Katie. So, yes, indeed. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, I've got this old school technology here called paper and pen because I'm a product of the public school systems in this country, um, concordantly. Here's a list of what I will now describe to you in my essay. Uh, that is not Mr. McLeod, my high school English teacher. That is Casey Ryback, who is fantastic. So we're going to talk about automating and intelligentifying each, uh, each component of the life cycle that Matt went through. So the first step is, is obviously the, verse, the, the very best place to start. We want to start with by making two big moves in our environment. The first step is to get our threat intelligence requirements documented somewhere beyond Cuneiform or an Excel spreadsheet that gets emailed around for the RFP process. So we're going to take this, back, this data, these things that we require of our threat intel feed vendors, and we're going to put them in JIRA or whatever you're using for your CMDB, be it ServiceNow or Remedy or God knows what you got going on. 
but let's move past the analog Excel spreadsheet. Because once we've got it into something that can talk via an API, we can ingest this ocean of network and threat intel data, which I've symbolized with Cthulhu there, um, via API technology. Um, I am obviously biased towards my own tip, um, Eclectic IQ. Obviously, most of what I'm going to say today is wildly applicable to any tip that is not Eclectic IQ. Ours is nicer, though. Um, so <laughs> the first step here is to get your data out of this silly spreadsheet, off of the clay tablet, get into this something that the computers can talk to. Because when we talk to, when we make the computers talk to each other, they can, tr they can copy data. This is a sample that I generated using JIRA. Um, you can see I included the policy name in the requirement because requirements don't exist on their own. So we always want to go back to what the policy is. Here the policy statement is fraud, waste, and abuse is bad. Therefore collect uh, threat intelligence data related to uh, fraud, fraud, waste, and abuse. And you can see at the bottom that the API has generated artifacts from the tip that are now adding in and collating to the actual requirement. This is going to be huge because when we go to the next stage, we can use this data for starting to evolve policy. So the computers are doing all the work for us. These artifacts are being gathered in the CMDB, and now we can use that data to make an assertion around a given policy. Many of us have probably been victim of the no telnet on your network policy, even though you need it to do router admin. So this is a way to collate in an automated fashion <laughs> um, data that can be used to make reasonable assertions around policy. And let me tell you, you go into a meeting with a CISO with data, and it's a totally different environment. This is what the evolution is going to look like pictorially. We're going to have this monkey over here screaming and throwing stuff to some guy over here just having a brutally awesome day. I guess the next step would be a woman sitting there um, instead of yet another part of the sausage party. No disrespect. Love you guys. There aren't enough of us, though. So we're going to leave policy and requirement behind. Um, at some point, it is extremely boring. Um, one thing I do want to point out, though, is when we're in this situation, when we have this collated data together that the machines are copying, we can also use this to correlate to ROI. We can also go, well, we had these 65 triggers that cost $25 each, so that effectively costs you $1.8 million, Canadian dollars. Um, so the first step in the collection life cycle from automating and intelligence applying it is to embrace your new structured data overlords, also known as sticks. Um, I'm a big fan of sticks to one for a couple of reasons I'll get into in a minute, but these are the sticks objects that codify, that standardize, and these are not standards that we just came up with because we thought they were pretty. These are standards that have been vetted, have been voted on exhaustively by the six, the OASIS communities. So these are standards that can be relied on by anybody, regardless of where you are. Um, they exist, however, to be made whole. I cannot, um, I can't quit you, 6.2.1, until all of my indicator metadata has been populated. Once we've got established um, that you are, are cool with the six thing, we need to talk about where you're going to get your data from. Um, there are about 8.3 million open source sources available via Google. Um, there are also commercial vendors. Obviously, FireEye is a uh, well-known, very reliable threat intel vendor. But we're looking at feeds. And this is where the structuredness that comes from Sticks is going to be so helpful. We can also expect from the collection requirements to specify something called enrichment or contextualization. Obviously, the six objects on the left-hand side are less interesting, are less complete than the ones on the right-hand side. Um, for those of you in the crowd named Mike, I apologize. I, um, I'm surrounded by Mikes in my personal life, so they get turned into um, TTPs and threat actors all day long. But you can see that I've given the really evil Mike TA a quad, the quad one as his um, attack, you know, as his, his, his attack infrastructure, and I'm able to do all this enrichment. I'm able to create a more holistic picture, which is going to support future analytic activity. It's going to support future actioning activity, and it's not just because I was having a really great day playing on the internet. So. Um, 
Collection is really important. We need data to come into the platform. We need it to be in one place. We don't need to be talking to 95 different systems, although we will do that. But once we get all the data in there, we need to be able to pivot. Um, pivoting slash link analysis, I think conceptually there's some overview there. So if you want to argue with me over the semantics about that later on, please do. Not when I'm in front of a microphone, though. Um, pivot. Thank you, Russ. Um, we aren't moving couches here. Okay, we are creating links. We are creating relationships, which is a key part of the 6 qs environment between very disparate sources. You know, if we were doing this manually, or if we were doing this outside of a tip, you'd have to be like, you know, doing the magical reality thing where you cross your eyes and you can see the sailboat. Here we've made it almost programmatic. So when we, so still talking about the collection component, Internal data is internal. Wow, cool topology. Um, most of the internal data that you're going to be interested in from a collection standpoint is already going to be available in your SEM or in your data lake. Um, but there's an important determinant to, there's an important decision to make and then subsequently engineer. First, we need to identify what data should be sent to the tip as a feed. You know, this is something that's going to be sent regularly, every day, every week, every month, whatever versus what data do we want to just query from the tip. Um, NetFlow data is a great way to contextualize, to bring in that um, indisputable telemetry. Um, being able to ask if, an, if a given observable already exists within your security posture, within your secu security controls, and then simply mechanical items like go get me the PCAP because this horrible thing happened. When we talk about intelligence, or excuse me, taking the internal data idea a little bit further, let's talk about dumpster diving in our own network. This is probably my personal favorite part of doing intelligence collection from the network. And Matt and I personally both agree that um, grabbing blocked spam messages from your email security solution is really cool. It's really powerful. Because that's, you know, one of the big infection vectors, one of the big ways to get in. Everybody has to receive mail. So unfortunately, a lot of this data is not already in the data lake or the SIM, so good luck with that. Um, however, when we look at the other ideas here, we can start to write, contextualize, we can start to bring together disparate pieces, possibly in the SIM or possibly over in that giant Hadoop thing, and then create triads. We can look for IDS events that have partially succeeded. We can look for EDR events that have partially succeeded, and then send those ideas over to the tip for contextualization with threat intel. Metadata is um, one of the two most important tools we have as analysts. The other tool is skepticism. Um, when we look at metadata, you can see here a fairly short list of standards and frameworks and models and whatever noun you want to use. But they all achieve one objective. They try to standardize how metadata should be obtained and described. Um, I'm a big fan of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. I think it brings a lot of new context to things that we see in our old friend, the kill chain. So it's, you know, it's next step evolution for our, the, the Lockheed um, kill chain bunny. Obviously, sticks, if you're done hearing me about talk about sticks, you should just probably leave. Um, and then we've got the more mechanical type of bits of metadata, TLP, the traffic light protocol. Yeah, for left. Um, traffic like protocol to control dissemination, and then building your own ontologies that are specific to your environment. We all have stupid code names that some of us love. Um, and then we can use fun things like the KPEG for getting really dirty about the malware or exposure values, um, doing integrations with your security posture as well. Two important really thoughts about metadata. Um, one, it lives in a palette. You're going to have a whole gradient of values that are associated with metadata. So try to be somewhat open-minded when you are embracing an ocean of metadata. And then secondly, as aggressively as you can be with your metadata is going to translate to way more efficient searching actual analysis. Part of the reason I keep talking about this metadata idea is because of this. This is one of the most exciting innovations coming out of the 6.2x or the 621 specifically. This is the patterning language. This is a very, very, very simple uh, statement in the patterning language that is available. Um, but you can see that we're already using metadata to make very complex, very interesting analytic questions. And we're doing that in a documented fashion. We're doing that in a fashion that the tip can go, oh, we asked that question. 
Um, this is a sample of one of the queries that our Fusion Center runs, and you can see that we let the analyst type, and we regretted that. Um, but we've got a library of all of the analytic questions that are being posed by the, anal the analyst. So now, when we bring a new analyst on board, it's real easy for them to pick up where we're going. We're hopefully um, reducing churn. We are also standardizing how things are analyzed. What are the bits of metadata that need to be looked for? So you're going to get a consistent product regardless of which analyst is involved. When we look at, especially in the 2-1 world, when we look at um, the actual dirty parts, of the naughty parts of the query here, we can see two couple kind of neat things. One, we've got an idea of structuredness and completeness. We've also got relationship. The, the second uh, part of the logic there says, and exists data behavior dot attack pattern, which says within a TTP, show me a TTP that has a very specific field that has already been populated. Don't show me stuff that is that lacks completeness. Who watches the watchers? Um, and sometimes analysis can feel a bit like Groundhog Day where you're driving angry um, and you start with, you know, your piggy bank of interesting data and then you end up driving angry off the cliff with um, a groundhog in your lap. But as we make analysis introspective, as we document the queries that we're making from the analytic platform, from the tip, we're able to recurse, we're able to take our queries and evolve them, we're able to make them apparently into a 10-foot piggy bank in Germany. The other amazing thing about having the right kind of analysis requirements in place is that you can do de novo authorship. This is a threat model I built around um, an individual named Pickle Rick. Um, Pickle Rick apparently is related to two additional threat actors. He's got an ocean of TTPs, and then there's a bit of, of observable data, plus some internal incidents. When we look at doing de novo authorship, what we're really looking at is we're building a standard for all of the analysts to follow. Again, we're looking for a consistent way to deliver analytic products, to deliver threat intel products, but we're also able to drive the evolution of our collection requirements, of our analysis requirements. Look at all that data. That is not an IOC. So, Let's pivot again away from analysis and let's get into actioning. In the IOC only world, our, our options to, um, for actioning are somewhat singular. We can go update the security posture and apparently we're going to do it using Comic Sans. In the post IOC <laughs> evolution, you know, when, when we're slightly more evolved creatures, we've got Billy Mays there helping us out carry around our, our jar of Cthulhu. We've got way more options in terms of what can be actioned. A couple of really exciting things I want to point out here, and yes, this is exciting for me. Um, we're going to enhance vulnerability scanning data by contextualizing the results. Hey, turns out we're vulnerable to Apache struts. Okay, no big surprise there. Oh, it turns out that when we take that Apache struts vulnerability, we look at it inside of the context of the tip. Ooh, it's actively being pursued in the wild. Oh, oh, Equifax may have forgotten to patch something. So we're taking vulnerability scanning and we're contextualizing it with threat intel. We're taking the SOC guys to the next level, which is also a, a note back to the evolution theme. Um, we can bring intelligence into the SEM, which SEM vendors probably don't want me to say out loud. Um, we can route, we can do data routing for threat hunt results back into the incident responders. This is huge because a lot of times the threat hunters kind of hide behind a wall or they're working on their pretty feathers, and they're very pretty feathers, but we need to move their data into the world where it can actually be consumed by actual other analysts. Um, what are the other fun things up here? If we can mess with the security posture, we've got a whole bunch of entries on an ACL that might be messing with router performance. Well, how many of those entries are actually validly evil? Um, and we can also work on generating those reports that we all seem to be obliged to write. The next and final evolution of um, actioning specifically is to talk about sharing. Um, when we talk about sharing, we want to make sure that we are sharing structured data with a threshold of completeness and a threshold of associated metadata. Um, and we're never going to get that image out of our brains ever. Um, so I'm going to replace it with Mr. Meeseeks here. Um, 
we can we can do um, we can only sh we can share and the tip technology exists we have the tools wherein we can um, create structured intelligence for egress in an automated fashion out of your garbage data. I like to say that block data is the glitter of the CI data world. Um, glitter never really leaves you. Sometimes it needs to be food grade depending on the environment where you encounter it. Um, it is the glitter that can be shared with everybody, but don't just throw IPs out there. We already have at least five or six lists of IP addresses that are bad. Um, when we talk about sharing our block data, are we necessarily introducing an element of competition loss? Are we going to lose our competitive edge by sharing my block data? Probably not. You know, if Jim Beam and Jack Daniels as organizations got together and started sharing block data, they're not really going to, you know, be disclosing anything super leveraging for the other, but that might be the way that they collectively discover Lord Zima um, aggressively pursuing their network. So, um, these are the uh, URLs for a lot of the um, stuff that was in the... Um, the slide so far, and apparently I talked way too fast, so cool. Um, the important thing I want to show you, though, point out is the six patterning language right here. There is an ocean of really, really, really cool um, pattern language usage, use cases available there. Um, and I'm going to turn it back to Matt. All right, and just uh, just in, in conclusion, we just wanted to, to quickly uh, state that the threat landscape is changing. Uh, Bad guys are getting badder and uh, they're getting more sophisticated. And in order to, to help uh, combat uh, their increasing sophistication, we need to implement intelligence and that will help us prioritize our different investments. And um, also, there's a whole life cycle on how you can implement intelligence. It starts with requirements and it requires threat modeling, um, and it goes all the way to sharing. So with that being said, thank you so much for attending our talk. We appreciate uh, everyone coming on the, the, the very last uh, presentation of, of the con, and uh, uh, please uh, come up here afterwards if you have any questions or, or want to talk about anything we, we talked about. I would also, um, I'd also like to bribe you and or induce you to ask a question now for one of two remaining incredibly delicious uh, six 2.x reference cards. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. Hi. Um, so I do CTI. Hopefully none of my coworkers are in here. Um, no, I'm pretty sure they're not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Good. Um, so really quick question. Um, I have tried suggesting over and over and over again to use the data that um, that is blocked and to uh, basically reverse engineer the stuff, get the IOPS, all of that, and then put that into um, into our alerting system and all of that to make sure that we're blocked. I mean, of course, like, the edge is blocked, but that's only because of, like, one rule. So, like, what happens if, like, they change their tactic? So what is a way to, like, approach management with this as, like, a CTI analyst when they look at you like you're crazy? Suggestions, please. Okay, cool. Normally, Matt is much more adult in these questions than I am. I have purple hair for a reason. Um, for for any any issue where I, you know you're possibly posing a paradigm shifting, lifestyle changing decision for how your organization is going to part, you know um, behave, I think the most important assertion is the one that is based on data. Matt and I aren't the only ones who talk about um, using block spam. I mean, you've already got it yourself. Um, there should be resources within the OASIS community, especially with 6 2x coming um, very, very, very quickly. If you ask my developers a little too quickly, um, we're you know with the um, with 6 2x with the opinion object that's going to come in, we're going to see a lot more analytic hypotheses, and with those hypotheses needing to be populated and authored de novo you're going to want to start to pull that block data in and make it painful, you know, at the initial, well, no, I had to go over there and really punch a guy to get the block data, and if we just did the API thing, I could get it that way. Um, yeah, so, uh, I, I guess what, what I would add to that is 
uh, it's, it's very common for security professionals to have this, this, um, this, this response of, we blocked it, it's done, move on. Uh, but that's but th but that's that's not 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 the issue because as you know uh, you know as discussed the the adversary is is getting more sophisticated and they're going to continue to target you just because one thing gets blocked they are going to continue to target you so with looking at internally derived uh, IOCs what you're trying to do is pivot from the attack that they did tomorrow into the, or today, into the attack that they do tomorrow. And uh, how I've, I've tried to be successful with, with demonstrating that to, to the leadership of my company is, is by uh, summarizing what the actual threat is. So, not, so it, it ceases to become IPs and MD5 hashes, but actual campaigns targeting some sort of of of, uh, of asset within your organization, whether or not whether it's a, an employee or some sort of backend system. So bringing it up a level. You could uh, also refer them to this talk. Uh, yes, we have a question back. So, yeah, uh, with the more more and more adoption of TTPs, uh, but IOCs are not completely like evil. There no, is. no, not so, at all. But but the number of IOCs and the challenge of consuming them is. So what approach do you recommend with more and more CTI analysts completely ignoring IOCs? How, what approach should they take instead so that that's not completely put aside? I'm going to take you back to my Pickle Rick attacker here. Um, definitely don't put IOCs away. Stop calling them IOCs, though, because we're, we're all big fans of 6.2 now, and the big boys in the room call them indicators and not IOCs. Um, and, and I'm saying that mostly as an attempt to be funny, so the rest of you look like you want to shake me. I'm sorry. Um, bold female leadership right there. Um, so definitely don't walk away from the IOCs. Don't walk away from the observable data. However, ask the questions of your tip or wherever you're storing all your data of what does the observable take me to? What does, does it take me to a TTP? Does it take me to a threat actor? In, in our tip, and again, I'm biased and I love it. Um, you can actually sort the connectivity of the observable data, so you can go find the IPs that have the massive biggest number of node connections. So I'm looking at an IP address, and it's got 10,000 connections in the TI, you know, universe. I'm looking at an IOC, it's taking me back to a whole planet of TTPs that are fantastic. So use them as a pivot into the bigger object. I got one thing I'd like to add to that is it all it all goes back to your intelligence uh, requirements and yes. understanding who's targeting you. So uh, uh, what I like to look at is uh, if I understand that a particular data feed or group is not targeting my industry, then I don't need those IOCs in there. And you know, there's always the argument that. Um, uh, that, you know, you don't know if you're being targeted or, or not, but uh, sometimes with IOCs, uh, less is more. Really quick question. So do you guys use Multigo at all to enrich the data and pivot off of it? Or is it just uh, relying on your JIRA thing? To... The last time I used Multigo, I was pregnant with my second child who would not let me eat chocolate. Um, and the, uh, it was bad. Um, and, and the things I had to go through to get Maltigo to work were like right up there with, I want to punch a baby that I'm guarding my tummy. So, yeah. um. How did you get that? Most of the, most of the tips out there, mine included, right? Um, most of the tip, tips out there offer that as standard functionality. Um, because I know my product really well. We have 50 some odd open source and commercial sources that can be enriched against, i.e. we can run an API query as well as we can invoke that enrichment automatically. So when I go to look at this data, it's already enriched and I didn't even have to do it. And that, you know, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So the intelligence-driven risk management, mm -hmm. that's, you know, since I do CTI, that's an entirely, like, different department, like, no. They even dress differently. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're behind they different locked pants. doors. What's yeah, they wear about? pants. Um, I mean, why? So, like you know, here's the CTI person. You know, 
like, uh, you know, me, um, how would I even begin to approach a conversation with them about intelligence driven, like, hey, listen to me and what I say and what I'm finding out there and, you know, change your program based on that. Like, how do I get them on board? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, so in the, the approach that I would take is understanding, uh, what your, your deliverables are going to be and making their lives easier. So, so start, start small. So if you see a new interesting TTP that, um, that they should be concerned about, write up a quick summary and email it over to them. And, and at least on my team, we have templates, uh, of what we call an Intel alert. And it's just a quick little blurb about, uh, something that we found and then an, an analytical, uh, set of comments on why people at my company should be concerned about that. Oh, that's perfect. It's like a guerrilla marketing, but guerrilla CTI. And then I that, love it. and then that pivots into a new conversation after they like those Intel alerts. That pivots into a new conversation about how can we start compiling these to uh, to to help fuel you know our risk management program at our organizations. So. I just want to see Ross Gary yell about a president. Evan. Um, <laughs> to add to what Matt said, um, TTPs are awesome and sexy and all that stuff, but vulnerabilities are awesome too. And a decent threat intel vendor, a decent tip product, <coughs> um, will also be able to notify you automatically of new vulnerabilities, especially ones that have been contextualized already. All right. Well, I think we are out of time. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, uh, we'll be up here for a little while if you have any more questions. Thank you.